So today on the uh, Joe and Friends show, we have uh, Alex Wolford. Uh, he's currently a field engineer at Neo4j, but he's also uh, very knowledgeable about Kafka. So we're going to talk about both these things today. But Alex, it sounded like you had a, a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a scare yeah. before the, we got started. So yeah. yeah, I couldn't believe it. So, so like about 10 minutes ago, there's a power cut in my house and the internet's down. It's not coming back until 4.30, according to Comcast. But <laughs> thank God I'm close to a coffee shop. So I, I, I screamed down here in the car and uh, sorry, car, you know, but we're here and safe and everyone, everything's good. So thanks so much for having me, Joe. Yeah, of course. Anytime. So thanks for uh Thanks for making it on the show. I know that was a, a bit of nerve wracking. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, kind of walk me through, um, you know, people who don't know who you are. Uh, do you want to give a yeah. quick intro? Yeah. So I'm a sort of um, a bit like you. I'm a, a, a refugee from the data science industry. So I, I um, was a long, a long time ago. I was a supply chain um dealing with big data. I got a Hadoop cluster at the time. And um, I actually found the data side more, more interesting and lucrative uh, than the supply chain. Um, so I ended up um, becoming, you know, having a Hadoop cluster. And then I ended up working at stream sets for a while. So I got into streaming data. And then uh, I, I was at Confluent. And I, I, I guess I've just been kind of speed dating data access patterns for a while and uh and, and here i am uh neo4j kafka guy uh at your service thanks <laughs> that's awesome yeah you gotta quit the background that's that's pretty cool i think supply chain is one of those fields though that i think uh, it gives you um there's actual data problems to solve in supply chain um and uh yeah, I think it's a good place for, for data analysts or data scientists to cut their teeth too, just because there's there's real world impact on getting supply chain right and there's or wrong. So yeah, one thing that struck me about supply chain, Joe, is, is there's a lot of unstructured data. Um, so supply chain uh, to me is all about visibility. In fact, I, a long time ago, I went to school for supply chain. And uh, if I was to um, condense like the the program into a sentence it, it would be it's all about visibility sorry cranfield mm. university <laughs> uh, and um so in order to make that possible you, you need to connect lots and lots of disparate data sources and these might be you know apis um things on the public web and an example of this so i, I used to have to decide um what um, to put on the shelf but in, a, in a, an electronics uh, distributor and um, I started crawling the web and I, one day I was crawling a website and I noticed you know a competitor of ours had you know 100 units of some part on the shelf and then my boss said you know what have they got now and then I did a VLOOKUP remember those back in the day you had VLOOKUPs uh, so I did a VLOOKUP yeah you remember those Joe? Very much. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, I did a V lookup and, they, and, and there was a difference. And I thought, wow, they just gave me their, um, their um, sales, basically. They, they handed over their sales data by publishing it on the web. Uh, and then I, I was looking at all the other players in the market. And then, and then I, I started getting handy with writing web crawlers. So, so uh, I started crawling lots and lots of uh, different companies that had inventory on the web and then um, had a pretty good view of what's moving. And that enabled us to make smart decisions. What to put on the shelf, the lowest risk thing is something that someone else is selling and then you can sort of undercut them on, on mm. price. Uh, and then that will keep your inventory turns up, um, which is uh, an important metric if you're in Very. supply chain. So that's kind of like how my big data journey got started. That's really cool. That's really cool. And now you're, um, and we're going to talk about uh, Kafka and Neo4j and uh, all the fun stuff. Um, want me to uh, add your slides to the uh, presentation? Yeah, sure. tell me. I, I can't see, so tell okay, me. Yeah, uh, now it's on. So hopefully you can uh, check so it out. So in slides, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, so I want to start off and just uh, level set on what is Kafka and what is Neo4j. And then um, I'll show you uh, examples of them working together. And there are some things that I can't show. I so I was at, at my house. I had all sorts of tabs open talking to things. And thankfully, I left some of them open. Um, but um, it's, <laughs> uh, you know, it is what it is anyway. 
So um, my ex-CEO, who's now a billionaire, isn't that amazing? Uh, Jay Kretz, one, one day he's on, he's on a plane and um, he, he's working at LinkedIn and he has a, a data integration problem where they have lots and lots of um, you know, pr sources of data and lots and lots of consumers. And, and um, they originally had point to point connections for these things. And that was a freaking nightmare uh, to maintain. So there's constantly some other, you know, business unit or user who wants access to something. And then it, you get that spaghetti thing on the left. And then one, one day, Jay Kreps is uh, just, what, what, what if we used a log? Uh, and uh, he came up with this, this idea, writing all these events uh, to a log, uh, just a simple log that's, that's distributed and fault tolerant. Uh, but it was a different kind of take on, on pub sub really. Um, and uh, that was really the birth of Kafka. So on the right there, it says unified log. Uh, it did, Kafka didn't have a name at that, that time. Um, and uh, later on, I think they were naming all their things, their projects after authors. Uh, and one of the reasons, you know, I think Kafka was chosen because it, it writes very well, you know, Franz Kafka, the, the guy who wrote Metamorphosis. Um, right. <laughs> It's funny. Yeah, so, well, uh, go on, Joe. What's that? Well, I said I, I didn't know that tidbit. That's kind of funny, actually. So, oh yeah, um, yeah. There's, there's. Uh, I can't remember. There's a whole bunch of uh, author-based uh, projects from uh, LinkedIn. So, so this is the premise of Kafka, right? So you have this um, distributed log, and each one of those uh, messages there uh, has an offset. And you have a producer that does all the writing, and then you have multiple consumers. And Kafka is very, very good at fan out. Uh, fan out is like the ratio of I, I write once, how many times is that read? And uh, that's you know Kafka's uh, claim to fame. So it's used for lots and lots of things. Uh, and I'm going to show you an example in a little bit um, that's based on a, a recommender. And thank God I used the cloud for this uh, because you know my my home stuff is broken. Um, and one thing that Kafka, so, so this is probably like slash end Kafka, really. So, so one, one thing that Kafka allows you to do um, is um, have the same data synced to lots of um, different places. And this um, opens up lots of access patterns. So for example, on the, on the right there, we've got OLAP. Uh, so maybe you have you know, you want to do some slicing and dicing of data, put a web app in front of it, something like that. I, I, I worked at an ad tech company who did this. Uh, we used Druid, it was amazing. Um, so, you know, there's document stores, Mongo, Elastic, you've got Redis as a key value store, um, Aerospike, I think that's an awesome technology. And then there's Graph down there. Um, so my, my journey into Graph is, uh, I, would, I would often build things uh, for Confluent and um, I'd, I'd sync the data into a graph and graphs are so visual and people would often, so I'd go in and say, look, look at this pub sub thing, isn't it amazing? Uh, and uh, they would say, well, that's very interesting, but tell me more about that graph thing. And uh, that's kind of how I ended up at <laughs> Neo4j, the graph access pattern. It's kind of, it's, it's an addictive drug really. I, I, I kind of like slowly fell in love with the graph and uh, I hope you do too. So I want to um, point out a couple of terms that we use in graph just because these might come up in, in uh, conversation a little bit later. So a graph is basically you have nodes. These are names of things. Um, so um, a node in math speak is, is a vertex and a relationship is an edge. And Neo4j is a particular flavor of graph. It's called a labeled property graph. And uh, there's a language around this called Cypher that is quite, it's, it's based on ASCII art. So if you, if, if you create an object, it looks like a circle and the relationships all have arrows and things like that. So it's, it's, it's nice and intuitive. Um, so things about graph. Graph is often used for machine learning, uh, for example. So if you take traditional machine learning where you have 
you know, a col um, columns, data, data in a table, you have a bunch of covariates and something that you're trying to predict. Um, often, as a, as a feature of the graph, you can um, use um, graph, like things like degree at the bottom there, how many, how many uh, inbound or outbound connections. These features uh, often can help uh, increase the area under the curve. So if you're into machine learning and you're not using graph, that's, that's kind of a, a fairly low hanging fruit sometimes, um, depending on the use case. Yeah. So in, a, in graph speak, we have hops. That's how far away something is. Um, the relationships can be weighted. So if I say, you know, made, ma imagine I, I like somebody, uh, I could have a likes uh, relationship, or you could put a number, like you could have a number of one to 10, I really like them, or, you know, 10 to minus 10, like I really detest them, minus 10. Uh, so you can have weighted edges uh, in a graph. Um, maybe negative weighting is not a great idea, I don't know. Um, and direction, of course. So if I, if I marry someone, um, that's a bi-directional relationship, but you know, I might like my wife, but she might not like me. So there's, a, you know, directionality comes into play. Yeah. I hope she wants me. Um, so here's a, another couple of terms uh, that we'll, we'll get into a little a bit later. So a monopartite graph is where everything is the same uh, type of thing. So an example of this would be like Twitter. If you have a graph of, you know, people interacting with other people, all of the nodes in that graph are people. So that's a monopartite graph. Uh, a bipartite graph, and I'm going to show you an example of this in, in, a, in a recommender a little bit later, um, is where you have, you know, two, two different types of mode. Um, so I have users who view a page um, and other views that view that page. And then you can say people who like this also like that. Uh, so that's an example of why you might have a bipartite or a multipartite. Uh, graph. Okay. Interesting. So when, uh, when I'm interacting with uh, customers and what have you, and uh, some, sometimes it's helpful that there's something that, I don't know, do you come across resume driven development, Joe? All the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. you? Yeah, all the time. Yeah, so so people often think, oh, I, lo I just love the colors. I love I love the colors. I love the circles and lines. Super intuitive. And then often the the use case uh, doesn't. Uh, there isn't there isn't a use case there. So I think it's helpful to know up front. Like, do I have a graphy problem? Um, so these are sort of questions that I like to uh, ferret out um, up front um, before you know a bunch of engineering effort into something that's like clearly not not going anywhere um so to me graph is all about chains um so if you have if um the, the friend's friend is kind of a classic so Im imagine if you want to do my friend's friend's friends in a relational database that would be you know a table with a self-join and another another self-join and um, each one of those hops, you know, if, if you remember from computer science, you have the big O notation and it gets more and more expensive the further out you go. Um, so those those like, you know, traversals, that's a traversal. If in a, in a graph, that's just like hopping from one place uh, to another. Um, but if you're doing a self-join, that's like an index lookup. That's kind of a, a bit of an expensive operation. Uh, and the more of those you have, the worse it gets. So it's nice to know, do I have a graph-shaped problem in the, in the beginning? Where do you see people sort of, um, I guess, where do you see resume-driven development fall into, to, um, uh, I guess, misidentifying graph-shaped problems? Um, so things that are sort of uh, just pairs of things that could be solved with like a key value uh, store. Mm. Um, so uh, sometimes, you know, Redis could be used uh, and it's a lot, a lot simpler. Um, sometimes people um, just want to use graph because it looks interesting. Um, so they'll, they'll take something that's, uh, that doesn't have a chain in it. If it doesn't have a chain in it, um, there's, 
it's not really a graffy shaped thing. So um, sometimes people use it as in lieu of a relational database. One thing that graph does have though is schema -lessness. Um, so that gives you a, a ton of flexibility in that you can take an existing graph and you can add things to it. And it's not like a, a relational database where you have an alter column, alter table, add column. Uh, you don't have to do that with a graph. You just can throw things at the graph um, and, it, and you won't um, break anything um, mm -hmm. by adding new data types. So it gives you a bunch of uh, flexibility in that respect. Mm. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Joe? Yeah, I did. So these are these are graphy um, use cases. Um, so I, I map those to those those four questions. But you'll notice that each one of these, and I'll show you a couple of examples of of some of these. Um, so let's take network management for example. Um, infosec people will often use graph to understand what's the pattern um, to get in is there an attack vector how will i get from you know outside the network what's the path to get to my high value assets that's a, a classic graph for use case and it's quite easy to build um, you can do you can do things like packet capture where um, you know you sniff the wire i use something called zeek uh z-e-e-k it's uh it used to be called Bro, and it's like a, a protocol analyzer. You can write that data to, to Kafka. Yeah, let me show you. Uh, and once once you've got this sort of stream of data in Kafka, please, yes, thank God I clicked on this before I left my house. So the, the, these are um, things in my house talking to each other. Um, and, and you've got weighted edges here, so I can see, I can, I can uh, count the number of connections or packets or, or whatever. And based on what's talking to what, um, you can do something called community detection. Um, mm. So this is a sort of classification technique that groups uh, like things together. So, for example, these things up here. These are all my Sonos. I have Sonos in my house. So I have a bunch of Sonos devices and they all use this broadcast address. Um, so you'll see, you know, they, they, all, they all share something in common and the um, community detection algorithm, which is called in this case, uh, Louvain modularity has just lumped all those things uh, together. Uh, and it, it's dead handy uh, for, for uh, classifying things. Uh, uh, another example of where you might use Louvain modularity would be um, marketing. So maybe you have products and those products uh, are shared between certain people. You know, um, I'm into cycling, I like to wear spandex. Uh, so, you know, other spandex items, people who wear spandex are all into cycling, that would be kind of a community. And then you could use that uh, attribute and, uh, you know, show them pictures of uh, people wearing spandex and they're more likely uh, to buy things. Um, yeah. That's a lot of spandex. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and depending on where you are, that may or may not be a good thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, back to the slides. Um, I might have uh, some other examples handy. Let me let me let me think of what I have running on my laptop versus in my house. Supply chain visibility is a huge one. And in fact, I've just been um, working on something. Um, I took a bill of materials and a bill of materials is made up of items and those items have um, uh, parts that can be used in those items and those parts are made by certain manufacturers and those certain manufacturers might have, um, they might be public. So one, one thing I did um, in the last couple of days, uh, I, I took all the the public, uh, the 10K reports, for example, inside a 10K report, there's a section on a risk. And um, there are services um, out there on the uh, interwebs. I, first of all, I tried the Google NLP, Natural Language Processing uh, Engine, and it will pull out things like um, places, people, organizations, and what have you. And I didn't like the uh, Google one. Uh, it just didn't seem to do as good a job as the Amazon one. I, so I ended up using something called AWS Comprehend, 
it pulled mm. out all of the the locations of the places and an example would be uh, there's a there's a semiconductor company called Cypress uh, for example they have a big manufacturing facility right in front of a volcano oh. now if yeah, it's called Tal in the uh, Philippines, T-A-A-L. And then if anything happens to that volcano, that's a source of competitive advantage, right? So, so when, if you think about supply chain, it's, it's um, not uh, my company competing against your company. It's my supply chain competing against your supply chain. And if you look, if you look at, like, I don't know, the price of used cars, uh, th those have gone through the roof recently. Um, with all, all the supply chain problems, and there's an advantage to being able to connect the dots, right? If you see some some small company that went out of business, for example, that small company might leave a digital trail of breadcrumbs that connects it to something that's connected to something that could break your uh, supply chain and leave you in it with serious uh, uh, in serious problems. Mm -hmm. um, so people will often build knowledge graphs of their supply chain. And uh, another kind of good example of this would be Thomson Reuters. They've used Neo4j um, to, take, to, to, to curate the news. So if you know that um, if you're particularly interested in something and there's a few hops out, uh, that's, that, that might be interesting to you. If you build the graph, that's an easy, easy thing to uh, determine. Um, so that's... So supply chain visibility example, and then of course on the there's the the classic like shortest path and logistics and routing. You know if I if I'm moving product between two places and I might have multiple different routes and then one of them goes down, there's, there's a route finding uh, which is very graphy, kind of a, a classic. Um, well, I think I think uh, we should uh, dip into recommendations because. Every every business ever uh, has a has a use for some sort of recommendation. Right. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I think is differentiates uh, Neo4j against um, things that look like graph that are not really graph is this thing called index-free adjacency. Um, and what that means is, if you if you've if you've like written, if you went if you went to school and did computer science, there's this thing called a pointer, which basically references something in memory. And um, to traverse a pointer is like such a fast operation. Uh, whereas, and and this is that self-join um, scenario, right? Where you you if you have to look something up in an index, that's expensive and slow. Uh, and if you have to do a lot of that, it's really expensive and really slow. So this is that sort of big O, uh, you know, you can you can um, start in a graph and start hopping out and uh, make, you can do something like 200,000 traversals per uh, CPU core per second. So wow. it's incredibly cheap, yeah. Yeah, which means that changes the way you think about data, right? If you, if you're, if you can, um, make that many traversals, then you tend to have chains of things where you might not otherwise have uh, chains of things. And in a little while, I'll, I'll show you an example of, uh, of where I made a chain. Uh, but the, the actual server where that's running on is on my basement. So uh, you might have to take my word for it that it's real. We'll believe you. <laughs> OK, thanks, Jeff. So I want to touch on very briefly, there's this language called Cypher. Uh, so we talked about the label property graph, right? Uh, which um, is very whiteboard friendly. You know, if, if it looks a lot like you go up to a whiteboard and you draw circles and you have arrows to things. Uh, and then the Cypher language kind of reflects that a little bit and, and we'll see that. So in this case, these are my next door neighbors, they're Matt and Kathy. Notice that they have a colon person uh, that is a, a thing, a label, that's called a label. Um, and, uh, you know, there's Matt and Kathy and uh, a hospital here. Uh, so these are all the objects. And then you can have a relationship and you can see like they are married to each other. So that is a bi-directional relationship or a, a no direction, right? Really, that's, a, you know, Kathy can't be married to Mark if he's not married to her. Uh, 
except probably in some weird state. And um, then uh, they both work at some hospital. They're nurses. Um, so you can add um, lots of different relationships um, between those. One thing you might want to add is uh, timestamps. Um, so the, these are, are properties. You can add properties to the um, the nodes themselves, and you can also add properties um, to the relationships. And the properties can be sparse. Um, so if you don't know something, you don't you just don't add it. Um, so you don't run into those like uh, you you can set constraints on a graph, but out out of the box, it's like a very free form thing. You just put what you know. In the, in the graph, and that is your your truth. Um, yeah. So Matt's married to Kathy. They both work at the hospital. And this is the cipher language. I was talking about ASCII art a minute ago. So you have um, uh, we're looking up this this merge state. That, yeah, the merge. That's interesting. That's kind of like an upsert. Um, so if it exists, um, use the one that's already there. So look for Kathy. If she if she's already there. Use that existing node. If it doesn't exist, create it. So that's kind of like a a handy uh, bit of syntax. And and um, I hope you can see the the relationship between the ASCII art and the whiteboard like you can see the the parentheses are a little bit like the circle on the node and the, the arrow and there's like some conventions in there but this language anyway this language that i'm showing you here is called cipher uh and it's become a standard there's a there's a a, a graph standard uh for language i think it's called open cipher and uh it's it's very intuitive and kind of worth your time in my opinion uh I always had fun with it. And it allows you to put wild cards on here. So if you want to find like, you know, do the Kevin Bacon problem, how mm. how am I related to Kevin Bacon? You can put an asterisk or you can say how many hops out and it will turn that into a traversal in the graph and it will tear through that at a rate of clip. Um, so if you've got the right sort of uh, shape of data problem, it's an amazing thing. Um, but what you shouldn't use it for, yeah, what, what not to use graph for. Aggregations is, is kind of a classic. So if I want to say, you know, what's the average um, weight of, um, you know, people who live in Nebraska or something like that, that would be a, uh, like, you'd have to, you'd have to go and collect all of those things and it, it would be horrible. There's better technologies out there um, to do uh, aggregations. Time series is another one. So there's lots of like, not lot, there's a handful of um, technologies that are really great at, at doing time series, like like Druid, um, InfluxDB, Prometheus. Those are, those are specialized tools that are great at time series. So I, I'd so um, put, putting my Kafka hat back on, I would say you need to. Um, sync the data sync that you is is a like i'm writing data out from kafka topics you might you might have multiple syncs for the same data source and your application might use might take advantage of these different uh, data access patterns uh to 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 answer questions that users have interesting do you come across that much joe like the um same data lots of different access patterns or multiple uh, I'm starting to see that more and more, actually. Yeah, I think the days of using, I think everyone tried to cram everything into relational databases back in the day. And then for analytics, it was always about the, uh, you know, the star schema and stuff. And which I think is fine, except um, when you want to get relationships, you know, I, I would see a graph being probably easier in some ways. Although, as you point out, aggregates are not really that uh, <laughs> nice to work with. So, you know, um, yeah, that's an interesting. Yeah, I am seeing more and more access patterns and and different. Yeah, uh, time series data is, is becoming a lot more popular, too. So starting to see that. Um, yeah, more than centralization, I'm starting to see sort of just like a bifurcation and, um, and definitely splintering of different data access patterns. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, she had a question here. Oh, question. OK. Uh, yeah. Michael, uh, Michael Schulte here. Um, um, 
Sorry, he's completely covering you up, but I'll be quick. Uh, he doesn't have a, a background in graph theory or software and data engineering, but he read an article about a month ago that was quoting uh, J.U. from Tiger Graph. The article stated, as relational databases struggle with scale, one graph database vendor says a paradigm shift is underway and aims to make graph technology the standard approach for data storage. Um, do you think graph databases will be a niche data storage method, or do you see this going mainstream? Uh, and then it kind of cuts off. Um, Trying to be careful with the um, of the hype cycle. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's mm -hmm. a graph would be great for specific use cases. So yeah, I agree with the graph is great for, for specific use cases. So um, and and Tiger Graph that's a competitor competitor of Neo Four J. So so Neo Four J has been around uh, uh, for longer. It's written in Java. Um, I think. That, but if you think about graph as a thing. Uh, it's about 280 years old, so this is not really new. So I'm 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 actually surprised how how un, underused it is really. I mean, if you go to university and you, you do computer science, there's going to be a whole a whole section on you know li doubly linked lists and that, which is basically a graph, right? Linked lists are, uh, are a graph of, of sorts that you have next relationships and what have you. Um, so I think it's massively uh, underutilized, and I think um, the, you, you can see the, the growth in this space. Uh, um, Neo4j got a funding round. It was this, I mean, people hate braggers, uh, so I hope you don't hate me. Uh, <laughs> Brag away. <laughs> I was thinking that like, graph databases were like the fastest growing uh, segment of the database market. I, yeah, so we got three hundred and twenty-five million dollars uh, of funding, uh, and a big chunk of that was from Google. So Google believes in it. Um, uh, I think I think it's an underutilized data access pattern, and I think the underutilization come, comes about because everybody grew up uh, with SQL, um, and, and that and and the, the the when I think about the relational database, I really think it's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, I think I think it should be called like the set theory database or something. Mm -hmm. It's always like you know basically an intersection or a union or a minus left out a join. It's kind of like a minus. You know that those are all <laughs> set operations, and it and it's kind of ironic to me that the relational database um, is um, not really the best thing for highly relational data. So I don't think graph will ever like take over relational database or anything like that. Uh, I think um, it would take a few generations of, of data engineers to sort of uh, wean themselves off of the uh, current paradigm of relational databases, right? So I mean, I've heard it said like, you know, um, I think even Cod said it himself that everything should could be represented as a, you know, as a relation in a, a relational database. So I think people just take that literally and say, well, let's just let's just do that instead <laughs> even if it's like 50 million times more complicated than using a graph but yeah yeah i, th I think it's i think it wasn't really commercialized so, so if you think about you know when was oracles first released probably like 1980 or something like that <laughs> maybe i'm exaggerating but it's been around a long time um you know the uh the first like lines of code that were written um, for, for making graph uh, easily consumable for, for the masses was like, you know, turn, turn of 2000, right? Uh, so it's relatively uh, immature, relatively nascent. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So I want to show you, could we, we call to dip into a recommender? What's that? Uh, I, I want to show an example. Let's let's yeah, have a look at an example. Yeah. So so an example uh, uh, um, that I'm going to use um, a stream of events um, for, from my. This is from my blog, right? So I, I have a blog. It's not very good, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> it does generate uh, a stream of events, and and that alone is is handy to me. Um, so. And, and the reason I'm so um, into streams, the, this guy from uh, UC Berkeley uh, pointed this out nicely. Data has a half-life, so it, it kind of goes uh, stale. And if you can act on something in the moment, so imagine, you know, I, I, I'm going to Amazon.com or something. Yesterday, I bought a, what do you call it, a metronome. Uh, I'm looking for a metronome. 
if if I I'm probably going to do whatever I'm going to do in that session, or I might abandon it, or I might have bought it from somewhere else. Like the the ability to act quickly um, turns into conversion rates and revenue, and then it becomes like, well, if everybody else is doing stuff in real time and you're not doing something in real time, um, eventually your sort of market share is going to erode and and uh, you know die a slow, painful death. Uh, so, so I, I believe, I, I believe in the the time value of data. Um, Somebody was asking about your uh, your blog that you say is, is not that good. Um, Wolford io. Yes, thank you. Thanks for asking. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, so whoever that was, we'll see. Michael Schultz. Yeah, Michael Schultz. Um, Michael, Michael. Yeah. So we'll we'll find you in a minute. Let's let's see if we can find oh. Michael in the in the in the the um, the, the page views. Uh, ah, yes. You know what might happen though? Uh, yeah, the power cut. The power cut. This, the, this is a gaff on my part. Never, never put um, actual things in your own house. It's use the cloud always. Um, so the power. Yeah. Anyway, so we can see if Michael had looked at it yesterday, we can <laughs> we can we can see that. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, switch over scenes a little bit here. There's JavaScript uh, tags. So if you have a web property, um, there are a billion tags out there. There are th hundreds, thousands maybe uh, of services, and there are a dime a dozen. You know, startup companies come and go, and they all provide some little slice of um, someone's behavior. So this is kind of like a, a little zoo of of um, scrappy companies who have made like cool things that tell you things you don't know. So there, in order for you to be able to um, consume all of these different things, it used to be that you would take the, this JavaScript snippet and you'd go to your website and then you'd, you'd put that snippet on there. And then, and then um, you'd, oh, you want another one? Okay, I'll put it in there. Oh, and it, you're putting, putting it in templates all over the place. It's a freaking nightmare uh, to maintain. So then this category of product called a tag manager came about, and there's a bunch of them. There's Segment IO, there's Telium. Um, I use Google Tag Manager because I love free things. Um, so what, what Google Tag Manager does, look, I drew a little container here. So you, you have a container where you put all of your JavaScript tags inside this container, and then you just put a reference uh, to this container uh, on your uh, on your website, and that way you can just go nuts with oh yeah, I want I want to try crazy egg. I want to do you know hot jar. I want to see where people are hovering over, and and there's so much incredible information uh, in this uh, in tag management. So this is what I've got. I've got a, a Google Tag Manager tag. And I want to show you, if you've not seen this, uh, it might be interesting. Uh, tag Manager Google. Let's let's just log in and have a very quick look. And you can see all the tags that I have running. And maybe if this is interesting, you can take a look at one of them. So you have this container. And if I pop over to tags in here. So these are all things that you know I found somewhat interesting. Uh, like this lead feeder thing here will tell me, like if someone... If someone from a specific university or company clicks on my website, it will say, hey, do you know, someone from General Electric in Detroit looks at your your blog and, you know, like, oh, great, that's exciting, cool. Uh, so uh, that's what this does, Hotjar tracking. It, it tracks um, movements of people. So you can see, like, maybe you have a page impression, but there might be some part of the page that people find interesting. You can see where they're... They're, they're hovering and you can do, you can replay. I, I think it's pretty amazing. But anyway, I digress. The snowplow tag, this is where I'm going with this. There is uh, an analytics platform called snowplow. You can roll your own. Uh, don't put it in your house, uh, but put, put, put it on the cloud. Uh, so I have a, 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 a host here. This is unfortunately in my house, but if you click on my blog, it creates a page impression in Snowplow. And uh, I'm going to pop over to Kafka, and then we can have a qu quick look at it. So let's, uh, what am I going to do? Go to Confluence. Uh, yeah, my old 
my old friends, Confluent. Let's log in. And may, maybe the internet's back up and we'll see the, the real time list. And if not, uh, we'll, we'll get one from yesterday. So this is my, my Confluent uh, Kafka cluster. And so I have the, the most interesting topic, snowplow enriched uh, JSON good. And now, I don't know, let's, let's just jump to an offset. I don't know. I just want to see some messages so I can, I can show you what one of these impressions looks like. So when you click on this uh, website, uh, you get all of this like telemetry. And it's kind of amazing to me just how much uh, you get. Uh, so, so this is uh, probably me, actually. I'm, pr I'm probably the biggest user of uh, Wolford.io. Um, but I went, <laughs> someone went to this. Oh, look, this is how that website is made. This is the special source right here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you want to know how to build this, um, it's, it, this blog article here will tell you. Um, so... Um, I've got a page impression here. It tells me where I am. So from an IP address, there's a there's a company called MaxMind that do GeoIP lookup. Uh, so that's where this lat long came from, and that can be helpful for things like demographics, right? If you if you get a fairly precise geo, um, it used to be um, the precision is kind of an important thing to pay attention to, and it, it used to be that there was some farm in the middle of the United States that was like technically the, the middle of the centroid, and um, everybody who did something um, disgusting on the internet that got the FBI's attention, uh, but the, the FBI kept on showing up to this farm, uh, and the people got very kind of annoyed, and then they changed the center of the United States to a lake now. So when the FBI, FBI show up to like, you know, seize the hard drives of the, the, uh, the subway uh, guy or whatever, uh, you know, that's, uh, they, they show up at a lake, and they're like, oh no, it's a lake, yeah, darn it, anyway. I digress. Look at all this. Uh, we've got um, browser size, time zone. Um, yeah, so look, it, very specific stuff about the user agent, even the versions of the browser. Um, and you can even grab other third party cookies uh, from here. So you can grab someone's like uh, Facebook cookie or, and, or Pinterest or an, anything. You can, you can just like, Stick it in the payload. You might need it later. Um, so, so that's um, what Snowplow uh, looks like. That's that's this what you get by, from these uh, JavaScript tags. We are getting back to graph. So, if people are not into uh, ad tech um, and collecting information about people on the interwebs, then we're gonna we're gonna come back around. Um, so, this is what Snowplow looks like. You've got these trackers. That, that's that JavaScript tag that, ran in, that runs in Google Tag Manager. It hits a, a collector, data collector, that writes it to a message queue. Uh, and then that um, enrichment, th these are things like pass out the user agent, um, put the, IP, the lat long from the IP address. Uh, that those, that those are enrichments. And this is kind of the classic Snowplow um, you know, what, what you get if you set up Snowplow. And I thought, I was looking at this, and I thought, well, it's good up to this point. Uh, to the right, to the right of Enrich, um, and, and look, I, I, used, I used to write R, uh, and, and this was me, you know, I, I didn't, I was never really any good at it, so that's why I'm frowning. But, and, and, but the, the other reason this um, analyst is frowning is because his data is so old. He's looking at all these things that he could have done had he known yesterday, but unfortunately, the, the uses are bounce, um, so that's why he's drowning. So I split it right here, uh, and I'll, I'll show you. I had to do, do something uh, to make this work. So we've got the browser. JavaScript tag writes this like long string thing. Um, it gets picked up by Snowplow Collector. This is just a service uh, that's running. And it's a bit of a hodgepodge of um, ugly formats here. And, and I, the, the thing that I struggled with when I was looking at this is like, do you, do you throw everything out and start from scratch just because you think you could make it more elegant? Probably not, right? Probably this company's been in 
in business for years and years, and they, and they they're ninety ninety five percent awesome. They just have some things that I don't love. So one of the things that I don't love, thrift. It's an ugly serial. Well, I mean, I'm sure there's people out there who love thrift. I don't love thrift. It's a serialization format. Yeah. Uh, then, then this enricher thing that does the GOIP lookup turns it into TSV, tab separated variables. That to me is a bit of another like, you know, uh, made me throw up in my mouth a little bit, uh, but it's okay. And then, and then I wrote a Kafka Streams job that converts it into a nice machine friendly data uh, JSON. Um, and I, you know, I think you, I. You could, you should probably, I should probably have, uh, you know, gone for extra credit and, and done the whole Avro thing. But, uh, you know, so it's, I was building it uh, uh, to show the art of the possible and not because um, I'm trying to get a job at Facebook or something. So, yeah, that's what it is. Um, and so this is the kind of the flow. This is how the, uh, the recommendation engine works. Now, um, based, and, and I, I almost want to revise this, like I, I put stateless services Docker here. Unfortunately, this Docker thing is running in my house. Don't run, don't run things in your house. Yeah, but, but in, in my next life, I'll put this in Kubernetes uh, and it will be sort of super fault tolerant. But the, the, the stateful services, so to build a recommendation engine, there are, are stateful and stateless services. The stateful services um, are things uh, that you really don't want to screw up because you, you could lose data and uh, you know you could get fired. That's 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 like a risk of loss of job if you if you screw this up. If you screw this up, you know you 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 might lose a bit of data and then you're like oh you know there's a hole in our in our feed but it's okay you won't get fired. But if you screw this up, you just might get fired. So I like uh, I like services so. I use Confluent Cloud here, so that Kafka is Confluent Clouds, and I use Neo4j Aura, which is a sort of, you know, self-serve managed um, Neo4j in the cloud. So all these things are running in my basement. So what happens? You've got your page impression. It hits Nginx. Um, I can, I, I, and Nginx has like a nice uh, plugin for Let's Encrypt, so I can, I can de, de Crypt my SSL, and then I don't. Then I've got plain stuff. It's easier to handle. So I, I use uh, Let's Encrypt right here. Uh, so I'm talking HTTPS publicly, and then privately, it's just plain because I don't care. Uh, and I have two streams of data here. So one of them is a click stream of events, which we just showed you it was by logging into Confident Cloud. We saw this stream of events. It goes in through the, the Dockerize monster here and then spits out into uh, Neo4j ultimately. And then on the other side, when, so when I browse to a page, at the bottom of the page, there is a, like a recommended for you section, which will be broken because of my internet outage, but that, because that lives in here. But if it wasn't broken, um, it would make a request uh, to say, hey, uh, recommend a service. Can you please query the graph database and tell me what I should look at. And then a query runs in the graph database that says people like you also like that, and then sends back recommendations and they get rendered on the page. So this is kind of like a bi-directional, like not, these things happen independently. The, the click stream and the recommendations, they're just you know, asynchronous things that happen independently. And that is how the recommendations happen. And I want to just like, you know, tip the hat to uh, something I love about Kafka uh, here. So we've got the JavaScript tag and it writes to different topics and there are multiple hops uh, through this. And a, and a sort of pro tip um, for um, people who are building things, you can store a lot of stuff in Kafka. You can do infinite retention. So what I've done for, for myself is with the raw events coming in, I store those forever and the other stuff, you know, maybe it can go offline for a bit. Maybe I don't notice for a few days. It's fine. I'll just have a week. If ever I want to go back in time and, and reprocess the data, this having the, the raw data stored forever, I think it's kind of neat. It's, uh, it's handy. So that's why I have infinite retention 
on the raw stuff. And then the, the things that happen downstream, you know, I don't need to keep those. I could I could set whatever tension policy I, I want there, but you know, this is this is handy. That's that's a handy thing Kafka does. So I want to show you this graph anyway. Let's let's take a quick look at this graph. And I bet it yeah. Uh, uh, where's my where's my Neo 4J? Did it log me out? Oh, Snowplow, please, please still be connected. Snow Snowplow database, please. Okay, it's asking me for a username and a password. That's kind of annoying. All right, let's uh, let's grab this. Grab this password. So, and go to Neo4j, and let's connect. So this is that user uh, graph. This this is the uh, recommender. If I pop over in here, I can see you know these are all my page views, and if I if I take the limit out of this, we should see a few hundred of them, and we we should be able to see. You know the relationships between users and pages. Uh, that this thing is called uh, browser. It's like the, and basically, look, you can see that there's a lot of commonality between these these people here. Well, let's take it. Let's take a, another look. If I'm one of these people here, right? I haven't seen any of these pages, but people um, people who also viewed this page might be interested in uh, this this page here. So look at the, on the bottom on the title bar. This is a, 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 a an article about Confluent Cloud and Neo4j, right? Uh, so people who looked at capturing clickstream data with Snowplow, they might also be interested in this page. So that's the gist of how the, the recommendation engine works. So you're hopping through uh, things to sort of uh, determine, you know, what what someone uh, should look at next. Um, and this works kind of, I mean, it, it absolutely works. This is a solid recommendation engine. But the one thing I noticed, I was thinking about the chains uh, of things and um, in my, uh, the, the sort of next uh, version of this that I, I have built, and I've built this like in parallel. I was watching The Godfather the other day. I watched The Godfather mm -hmm. Trilogy on Amazon. And um, look, check out this recommendation. So you you, you watch Godfather. This is, I, 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 yeah, look, it's two. <laughs> how, how is that impossible? Like I just watched two, uh, and and so this clearly this um, doesn't look at what people view next. Um, so so uh, I was thinking about you know if I watch Better Call Saul, for example. When I'm Breaking Bad, let's say I watch Breaking Bad and I'm at like episode nine, season five. I should watch episode 10, season five. I should not watch the best episode. I shouldn't watch something else. <laughs> like... the, last, the last episode. Um... Yeah. yeah, exactly. That was so dumb. Uh, and and uh, some recommenders. So, so this, this is uh, kind of a nuance about that, that recommendation engine um, that, you know, yeah should pay attention to the sequence for certain things. And maybe you have like a hybrid recommender. Maybe you have a list of uh, chapters in something and then, you know, you, you need to sort of meld the two things together. Um, and, and I wrote something, which I was, I was planning to show you. Uh, I can't show you because, uh, because of the whole interwebs thing. Um, but I wrote, I wrote something that makes these long chains and there's a next uh, relationship. So if I, if I had, you know, just watch part one of something. The next, the thing that people do next, you can you can grab those. You can do a select statement, a, a match on on those, and say, show me, you know, stack rank what people do mostly after this. And this is a very common thing for sort of journeys, um, click stream analysis, um, patient journey. You know, if you're in the medical space, you know, you, you you start to make these chains of events. And what you're looking for really is, you know, did someone die? Uh, and then, and then you can sort of start to go back down the chain, uh, and then it, maybe you can detect something early on. You, you, you might have a signature of events that you're you're looking for, and then maybe you can get ahead of it uh, if you if you if you know what to look for. But these these chains, that is a very very graphy thing. That's awesome.
um, I wear, I, I've rambled, I've ra or I'm sorry if I rambled too much, uh, but I rambled and, and I wanted to sort of tip my hat. So <laughs> there, are, there are like about 50 different algorithms uh, that you can use um, in, in a graph. So I, I showed you earlier on this community detection, right? The Louvain modularity, but there are so many of these things. Um, and, and if, particularly if you're in data science, there's embeddings. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, I noticed you, that. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So you can uh, take a, a graph and you can turn it into a matrix. So you can, uh, uh, and then, um, you know, do learning on, on the matrix that you get out of the relationships between all the things in the, in the graph, um, which I think is, uh, you know, very, very neat. Uh, and then, of course, there's similarity and all sorts of things. Someone asked me, yeah, I, I was talking to uh, someone who's using graph um, to track um, stuff from images, like, you know, someone's moving around. Imagine Sarnayev. Remember that guy? from Boston, you know, he's, he's wandering around with a red backpack. That's kind of a similarity feature. You can, you can take like images, you can, you can um, use GPU, pull out some attributes, stick them on a node, and then you can see where someone's moving from and to, and like, there's all, there's no end of stuff really uh, that you can do uh, with all the, with all the things. So lots of tools, lots of fun uh, things uh, you can do with Graph. Yeah. And, and really Kafka, cool. of course. Yeah, and Kafka, of course. Uh, if you want to get started with Neo4j, uh, how would they do that? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so what I would do is uh, go to Downloads, Downloads, uh, Neo4j, and uh, there's a desktop thing here. So uh, you can download like a... The latest version you can run it yeah look here it is this is this is a uh, neo4j running in in on my uh, laptop um and you can uh, you can build things there's one thing that if you're an app developer yeah look there's uh, something called grand stack which it also is um a very uh this is really only if you're into app development but there's a a, a one-liner command that stubs out um a fully fledged web app. So um, you can build things that are backed by Neo4j, but it's using React on the front end as a very fast way to get started if you're an app developer. But if you're a data person, uh, go down the uh, the desktop route and, uh, and I hope you won't regret it. And if, if there's anything I can do to help, um, you know, got my LinkedIn details, reach out. Uh, and uh, I, lo I love this and I, I love, I'd love to connect with you. So it seems like every time I see you too, you're doing something really cool um, with a Kafka or or some sort of technology. Um, it, it's always fun. I remember when we we're hanging out, you'd, you'd uh, pull out your laptop and say, "Hey, you should check this out. It's really cool." And I'm like, "Yeah, that's that's pretty dang cool." I think you're doing like Kafka and machine learning. One time we're hanging out, so um, yeah, yeah. I'm a whore. I'm a little bit of a whore, a tech whore. Yeah. <laughs> In the nicest way possible, of course. So, uh, well, awesome, man. We're kind of up in time. Um, for people who uh, want to uh, find you on the interwebs, uh, you said LinkedIn, uh, yeah. yeah, Wolford.io uh, yeah. as well. Um, yeah. Anywhere there's, else? Uh, there's so LinkedIn. I'm Alex Wolford, and there's uh, at biggest data, at biggest underscore. There's an underscore. Biggest. Yeah. Is yeah. that a Monty Python reference? It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> I was surprised it wasn't taken. I couldn't believe it. Like, oh, man, lucked out that day. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. My kids just recently discovered Monty Python, so um, they, uh, they watched that, they watched that uh, clip the other day on, uh, what was it, Life of Brian? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, I'm sure they had fun with that the next day at school. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, Awesome. Well, it's been fun. Um, great having you on. Uh, and, and thanks for, um, you know, uh, uh, pulling through, especially with a uh, sudden power outage <laughs> at your house. So. Yeah, I'm glad it worked out. I was, I was terrified when uh, the internet failed, but it worked. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> well, Alex, we'll have to have you back again. It's always, it's always fun talking with you. So, Thanks a lot. Thanks for everything, Joe. Thanks to the audience for the questions. So uh, next, next week on the uh, um, Joe and Friends show, we have uh, Todd Bouchain from Firebolt. He's going to be on talking about Firebolt. So stay tuned on that. So, and also we're doing a Let's Talk Data Engineering uh, live stream on Friday, 1 p.m. Mountain Time with uh, 
Chris Tab joining us from the UK as always. So um, can't get enough of the Brits these days. So <laughs> that's awesome. All righty. All right. See ya. Thanks. Have a good one. All right.